Can everyone see my screen? Could somebody give me a... Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Okay. Great. Well, this morning, I'm gonna, or your afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about transition design, which is an emerging transdisciplinary approach for addressing complex, wicked problems confronting 21st century societies. We often say that transition design brings together two global memes. And the first is the idea that entire societies must transition toward more sustainable, equitable, and desirable futures. And second is the realization that these transitions will require intentional systems level change. And you can see evidence in these memes in the number of transition related projects and initiatives springing up around the world and the recent rise in what I'll call deep systems thinking and the proliferation of knowledge, tools, and processes for understanding complex systems and systems problems, or as they're known in the design disciplines, wicked problems, which are really things like this. Crime, racism, income inequality, climate change, terrorism, political and social polarization, and global pandemics. These problems have enormous consequences, but we argue that they're also barriers to transition. They prevent our organizations, communities, and entire societies from transitioning toward the futures we want. And we call these problems wicked because of characteristics like these. Every wicked problem is unique and constantly changing. There are multiple stakeholders with conflicting agendas and no clear shared problem definition. These problems straddle organizational and disciplinary boundaries, and every wicked problem is connected to other wicked problems. It probably sounds familiar to many of you. So learning to see and map these interconnected and interdependent issues that are at the heart of wicked problems we think is also at the heart of systems thinking and we believe is the key to resolving wicked problems. We argue that often these large wicked problems remain invisible to us because we're too busy focusing on the smaller individual problems right in front of our nose. Here's what happens. We view problems within the narrow but manageable context of our own of our organizations, industry sectors, fields, or disciplines. Areas like local or national government, policy, the nonprofit sector, NGOs, funding and philanthropy, all kinds of industry, and many more. We identify a problem usually within our organization or sector, and it's urgent, we're all doing triage all the time, and we set about finding a solution for it. And secretly, we hope to find that single silver bullet solution for that single problem. This hope runs deep in all of us, that if I just look hard enough, I'll find the right solution. But we often harbor other hopes as well. We often secretly hope it can be solved with either money and or technology because these are clear, quick, doable fixes. And this is going on in different sectors all the time. The only real difference is that each sector or discipline has its own unique problem solving methodologies, processes, and tools. And these approaches work really well as long as we stay within our own field of expertise. But trying to collaborate across disciplinary divides or perhaps even across departments in a large organization can be challenging to say the least. It's a little like this old parable of the blind monks and the elephant. The problem looks like a different animal depending on your perspective. So achieving a collective shared problem definition becomes impossible. But here's the catch. Single silver bullet solutions only work on simple problems. When it comes to wicked ones, they're rubbish. Here's basically what happens. We think we're addressing a single problem when we're actually addressing a problem cluster, multiple interdependent problems whose interconnections remain invisible to us. So we just keep aiming single solutions at what we think are single problems but in reality are pieces of a bigger problem cluster. 
And we could keep doing this for weeks or months or even years, and we might put dents in the problem. But despite all the resources and energy we keep investing, many problems resist resolution because we don't see that these seemingly unrelated problems are connected to each other in complex ways within and across sectors. But wait, it gets worse. These problems are also connected up and down systems levels. So to understand these problems, we have to look upstream or more precisely up systems levels. Because this is what we're really dealing with, a complex web of interconnections and interdependencies across sectors and up and down systems levels. And this web of connections that involves both social and material interactions is what keeps these problems stuck and extends their consequences into the social and environmental spheres. This is why we call them wicked. And here's how we think about the tools and approaches needed at these different levels. So at the lower levels, we're finding and resolving familiar problems in our own sector industry using familiar tools and methodologies. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. If we trace the problems resisting solution upstream to higher systems levels, we're getting into territory where collaboration across disciplinary divides has to happen, even though it's difficult. And it requires tools and innovative cross-disciplinary approaches. Now, these are new, but they do exist. But at the level of a wicked problem, we're in new territory. There are very few existing tools and approaches for addressing these problems. And yet, if we solve for a wicked problem upstream, the positive results quickly trickle downstream to solve for multiple seemingly unrelated problems simultaneously. And this is really the premise for transition design. Now, I've diagrammed all of this in a very simplistic way. In fact, I've drawn them like we think of them, little separate boxes with their own separate issues. But this type of compartmentalized thinking is actually part of the problem because this is actually more what it looks like. Multiple sectors, industries, and fields of all sizes separate, represented by the white bubbles with countless interconnected interdependent problems overlapping them in the blue and the orange bubbles. And it's this invisible and unexamined web of interconnections and interdependencies across sectors and up and down systems levels that keeps these problems stuck. And to complicate things even more, these problems are heating up and cooling off all the time. It's a little like twinkle lights. And the trick is learning to read the complex systems dynamics to see which problem clusters are lighting up at any given moment. So you get the idea. Transition design works a little bit like Chinese acupuncture. Acupuncturists use needles to intervene in our system to transition it back into health and balance over time. But the acupuncturist has a map of the system and we don't. So in a way, we are flying blind when we implement any solution to a complex wicked problem. So what we really need is a map of the system's problem and its system's context. But to do this, we need to have a better understanding of systems themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, how they behave and how they transition over time. Essentially, we all need to become students of systems and systems are perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other and one says, how's the water? And the other says, what water? Marshall McLuhan in his book, War and Peace and the Global Village said, one thing fish know nothing about is water since they have no anti-environment, which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. Systems are so ubiquitous and our interactions with them so pervasive, we don't really see them and therefore we don't understand them very well. Our work at the Transition Design Institute is concerned with how we all can learn to see systems and understand how they behave. 
So we live in a world of systems, nested within systems, nested within systems. There are transportation systems, infrastructural systems, financial, economic, and communication systems. And all of these are permeated by cultural and disciplinary norms, laws and informal practices, or general ways of doing things. And together, all of these form what are known as socio-technical systems, which in turn are situated in the natural world. And these systems are always in transition because human societies are always in transition. But these transitions have been largely unintentional, full of drift, and we only understand their ramifications in hindsight. We call it history. The question before all of us in the 21st century is whether we can intentionally transition our organizations, communities, and entire societies toward more sustainable, equitable, and desirable long-term futures. Because the futures we're currently transitioning toward aren't necessarily the futures we want. But transition design argues that we can intentionally change these transition trajectories toward futures we do want. Now, I know it sounds like a monumental undertaking, but if we think about our experience of the past two years and transition trajectories, we can see that all of these countries started out at more or less the same place. And we've learned that small changes in the present can make a big difference in where you end up in the future. Transition design is essentially an approach to intentionally shift transition trajectories by resolving wicked systems problems. So we think of wicked problem resolution as a window into larger systems whose transition trajectories we want to change. And this brings us to the transition design approach, which is to frame these wicked problems within radically large contexts that include the past, the present, and the future. <clears throat> Sorry, got the wrong slide here. So <clears throat> these socio-technical systems are saturated by wicked problems that are rhizomatic and interdependent, as we said before. So because of this interdependence, if we successfully address a single wicked problem, the positive effects ripple throughout the entire system, solving for multiple problems simultaneously and changing the system's transition trajectory. But in order to do this, as I said, we need to frame wicked problems in much larger context than we normally would. And we need to banish the thought of single solutions to single problems. So in order to be able to understand large socio-technical transitions, we use a framework from Northern Europe called the Multi-Level Perspective Tool, or MLP, <clears throat> that explains how socio-technical systems change and transition over long periods of time. And researchers have identified three key levels, the landscape at the top, the regime or status quo in the middle, and the niche at the bottom. So the landscape level is where large events, collective beliefs, and social norms can begin to impact and fracture the regime level where we all live below. Landscape level forces usually accrue over time and exert gradual pressure. But as you can see here, <clears throat> events like war, 9-11, and COVID-19 can appear suddenly and unexpectedly creating sweeping change throughout the system. The niche level at the bottom is where small experiments and innovations can be incubated off the radar and go unchallenged by the status quo. Niche level events include in new inventions, technologies, and practices, or even radical new policy ideas such as universal basic income. But the important thing to know is this, large unexpected events like COVID-19 always open up opportunities at the niche level 
that can be exploited for good if we learn to read the system's dynamics. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you just two examples of how change happens in these large socio-technical systems. So here, conditions that were already present at the regime level begin to constellate and exert pressure from within, opening up a fracture and letting niche level innovations rush in. Startups like Airbnb and Uber combined with social networking technologies exploited the fracture and rushed into the regime. And the speed at which they were absorbed into and transformed the regime was astounding. Their integration created more fractures and new industry ecologies formed around both Uber and Airbnb, utterly transforming the tourism industry as just one example. Now, a decade later, what started out as niche level sharing economy experiments permeated the regime and led to the rise of the sharing economic paradigm at the landscape level. But with these transitions come myriad unintended consequences in the form of wicked problems like the ones in red. Now, this is how the regime had looked for some time. But as we all know, in 2020, a few months into the pandemic, Uber laid off 3,500 people in a three minute Zoom call, followed by layoffs of another 3,000 employees just a few weeks later. Airbnb soon followed suit with a layoff of 25% of their workforce, all because of a major disruption at that landscape level known as COVID-19, our second example which showed up suddenly as pro a problem of nearly unprecedented global magnitude. And you can still watch it fracturing the regime in real time, igniting a flurry of niche level activity that's nearly impossible to follow, but which contains within it the seeds of paradigmatic change for good and ill. And as we observe this accelerated transition that we're all still in, we have to try to anticipate the unintended consequences of all the new innovations and practices that are being implemented at the regime level so that before these new innovations turn into wicked problems, we can begin to intervene. But even more importantly, we must try and read the systems dynamics to drive positive systems level change which will shift our current unsustainable transition trajectories. So let me now walk you through the transition design approach, which frames a wicked problem in a radically large spatial and temporal context. <clears throat> so wicked problems took a long time to become wicked and therefore will take a long time to resolve. So we need to frame them in problem contexts that explain how they got to be wicked and that help us decide what we want to transition toward in the future. The transition design approach engages many stakeholder groups who are connected to and affected by the problem to map the myriad interconnected issues that make it wicked and keep it stuck. This does two things. One, it facilitates a shared understanding of the problem and two, it enables us to identify what we call zones of opportunity, where solutions, or what we also call systems interventions, have the potential to solve for multiple issues simultaneously. In a second step, stakeholder groups identify their hopes and fears related to the problem. The results of this step reveal relations of opposition and conflict between groups, which are barriers to problem resolution, as well as relations of alignment and agreement, which we often call the low hanging fruit in the system, where solutions with broad stakeholder support can be developed in the present and near term to build trust between groups and chalk up quick wins. Next, we expand the problem frame into the distant past to understand how the problem evolved over the course of multiple decades to become wicked. This step requires the integration of both stakeholder perspectives, as well as knowledge from a range of researchers and problem-specific experts. The systems map that emerges 
shows the historic roots of the problem, which reveal insights from the past that can always inform solutions in the present. In the next step, we extend the problem frame into the distant future. Here, stakeholder groups co-create visions of a long-term future in which the problem has been resolved. They imagine futures that are more equitable, sustainable, and desirable. The results of this step reveal common ground among these visions, which can help stakeholders transcend their differences in the present, and aspects of these visions can often form the basis for present-day systems interventions. We next ask, ask stakeholder groups to think rigorously and creatively about a decades-long transition from the problematic present to the desired long-term future. In this step, they assess the present against their desired future to, to decide what to keep and what to leave behind. So now we have a problem frame that includes the past, the present, and the future. And we argue that then and only then do we finally have enough information about the system's problem to intervene in an informed systemic way with ecologies of systems interventions. These solution clusters act as steps along the transition pathway toward the desired long-term future. So ecologies of systems interventions are informed by both the present and the future. The problem map we generate in the present tells us where to place the solutions so that they have the greatest potential to solve for multiple problems or issues simultaneously. The long-term future vision acts as a compass or north star by which we steer our transition toward the future. And visions inform solutions to ensure that they not only address short-term issues, but also keep us on the transition pathway toward the desired future. Only ecologies of systems interventions, projects that are connected to each other and the long-term vision in symbiotic ways, will have enough traction to destabilize the wicked problem and ignite positive <clears throat> systems level change and transition toward the desired future. So this is the template that we use in our online transition design workshops that challenge participants to develop systemic solutions. And I should also add that we use the same template on research projects with actual stakeholders. So the vertical axis corresponds to the societal sectors from our problem mapping process. It encourages us to think specifically about where different issues are situated and therefore where solutions must also be situated. <clears throat> the categories in the top horizontal axis correspond to what we call the domains of everyday life that we use in our futuring exercise. This challenges participants and stakeholders to think about a future in, the, in a holistic way, up and down systems levels. So the conceptual illustration of the ecology I've been using comes into play here and begins with participants or stakeholders brainstorming solution concepts and thinking rigorously about which sectors and at which level of scale a particular solution would be most effective and likely to ignite systems level change. But what makes this an ecology of systems interventions that can ignite positive change is the fact that from the beginning, solutions are conceived to scaffold and amplify each other. And this is something that traditional problem solving approaches almost never do. So we begin by brainstorming solutions to address the problem, but also take into consideration the long-term future. So you'll notice that on the far right side of the template, there's a brainstorming area. Here is where workshop participants and or stakeholders and project teams can get their project ideas down on the board quickly. And these address different aspects of the wicked problem. 
Now I'm going to show you an example that we created using the wicked problem of COVID-19 in the United States. This example looks at ways to address that problem. And it's important that you note that these ideas are in response to both the deep understanding that arose out of mapping the problem, as well as the vision of a long-term future in which the problem has been resolved. So here you see that we touched on topics related to deforestation and its connection to pandemics, our vision for new patterns of living, and higher quality of life that centers around the home with less commuting. So at this point, these are not yet tangible project ideas or solutions, but rather concepts that can become the basis for actual projects and initiatives. <clears throat> so in a group discussion, we begin to look for possible synergies and connections between project ideas. And sometimes we had to let go of a really good idea and save it for later because it wasn't fitting into the larger ecology. So we begin a process of elimination based upon which concepts seem to scaffold each other. And that does not mean that they're similar projects. Sometimes two projects that seem completely unrelated can be connected because of the long-term vision or a near-term milestone developed in the visioning step. And this is really where the utility of visioning comes in. They prompt us to make connections between present day projects in ways we might not thought of before. So we keep sorting the post-its as we discuss ideas for different types of ecologies. And once we decided on an ecology or solutions cluster, we then moved onto the left side of the template to discuss where these ideas would best be situated. And ideally, this is a co-design process with stakeholders who have deep knowledge of the problem and its context. Keeping in mind that diversity is the strength within any ecosystem, we've developed solutions that are different yet complementary, and we've placed them in different sectors and at different levels of scale. So at this point, the concepts can now be turned into proposals for actual projects and initiatives. And here is our matrix of ideas for specific projects and initiatives that could be funded to address the wicked problem of COVID-19 in the US. Each colored square represents one concept for one project or initiative. And each box contains the, the description or what we in the States call the elevator pitch for a real world project aimed at a board of directors, a C-suite team, or a funding organization. And all of these concepts are connected to each other and their symbiotic relationships have been described in the connecting lines in yellow. So this is an example of a workshop exercise, but the template is also being used on actual projects where this process with stakeholders takes much longer. When completed, the matrix can serve as a blueprint to jumpstart systems level change and transition. So here is how our post-its led for proposals for actual projects. In this example, you see that we started with the issue of deforestation and our vision of rewilding vast areas of the planet. You'll see that we've placed the original post-its that inspired the projects in the upper left corner for your reference. The green boxes represent three tangible projects in the environmental sector that are placed at the levels of the city, state, and nation. The city level rewilding intervention is directly connected to a national initiative, and both of those are connected to the creation of an organization that teaches children the value of place-based knowledge and eco-literacy and awareness of zoonotic diseases. The Sustainability Scouts Initiative would be networked at the state and regional levels and their efforts tied to reforestation. Projects like these often fail because of a general lack of support from citizens and voters, and that weakness should inspire another project to scaffold it. We thought this could happen via education and awareness campaigns. 
The orange box is positioned in the social section because the intervention aims to change how people think and act. It's positioned at the state level to broadly communicate and educate children as well as citizens about the importance of reforestation and the prevention of zoonotic diseases, but also to reach voters at the state level who must support policies to fund those efforts. This campaign is conceived in partnership with the Center for Disease Control, which exists at the national level. So you can see that from their inception, each intervention is conceived in concert with others to intentionally support and amplify them. And this touches on a really important component of systems interventions. Although practically any project or initiative will involve the creation of material artifacts, the change that they are aimed at is sometimes non-material, like changing thoughts and behaviors. So if we move to the left side of the matrix, we see another project at the level of the household, which encourages people to transform their homes to be more self-sustaining, growing food, creating pollinator gardens, and upgrading technology to enable remote working and encourage shared resources at the neighborhood level. That communication effort is scaffolded at the neighborhood level to create work centers that provide hot desking combined with daycare, laundry facilities, and a cafe so that people can meet their needs locally and within walking distance of home. Continuing the theme of work, a city level policy provides universal basic income for people who are unemployed or below a certain income level, who can choose from a list of organizations where they can donate and bank time and or learn skills. These organizations include both that neighborhood work center and the earlier reforestation initiatives in the green boxes. In the purple infrastructure area, we see a Center for Disease Control initiative at the national level to educate people on preventative measures and protocols for zoonotic diseases, which is connected to and scaffolds the communication campaigns that were mentioned earlier at the state level. This is directly connected to a global initiative to create infrastructure and protocols that enable scientists to rapidly share information and collaborate on the development of vaccines and other medicines connected to public health. This effort is also connected to various rewilding and reforestation efforts that are informed by data about the type of cross species interfaces that should be avoided. But the secret to designing systems interventions is really about the connections between them. Connections that enable projects to amplify and scaffold each other. And this type of symbiotic connection will be a specialty in itself and re will require what we think of as a type of transition diplomacy in which individuals or teams are working between organizations of all kinds to connect projects and shape them at different levels of scale and over multiple horizons of time. But it's important to remember that this is not a linear approach, but rather a cyclical one in which we are problem mapping, future visioning, and then system solutioning. And then we're waiting to see how the system responds to our interventions. And that is something that we're not very good at, doing nothing, waiting, because time is money and we want quick results. But working in systems means working in different time horizons simultaneously and designing for emergence and then dancing with the unpredictable results. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I have a question or maybe more a comment. While I was, uh, while the, you were talking about this. Yeah. Okay, is it better now? Yeah. Uh, I have a question or maybe a comment while you were talking about this shifting from, she still doesn't hear or, no? You can hear? Can you hear? Not yeah. very well, <clears throat> sorry. 
I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry, of <laughs> course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this. Uh, oh. <laughs> to make it shorter, just a quick. Uh, this shifts from Nisha to upsell. Is it? It feels like now it's uh, going faster. Is it because we are living in this time, or it is that in history previous it was going slower? What is your think on that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, if I heard correctly, does it seem like things are shifting faster? Yeah. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think they are. I mean, I think if we stop and think about it, we are at an unprecedented moment in human history. We are now completely interconnected on the planet for the first time in human history um, by transportation and technology and the internet. You know, something happens in one part of the planet and we know it immediately. Or we saw a pandemic become global within the space of a few months for the first time in human history. We've had pandemics throughout human history, but all of a sudden they affected all of us at the same time. Now, for those of us that study systems, I think we're still trying to understand the implications of that because there's both good and bad, right? We are psychologically, emotionally, and physically connected all of us together. And so we can do really good things with that or we can do really bad things with that as we're seeing happen, um, particularly in, in the Ukraine right now. Um, so we have to figure out how to harness the systems dynamics to drive positive change quickly. And I think the good news is if we can learn to understand the systems dynamics and we can harness the technology we can innovate very, very quickly. But I think the, the downside is we've not practiced long-term systems thinking in our generations really ever. You can find many examples on the planet still of indigenous peoples who have always thought several generations out or they have manage the ecosystems that they live within in a, in a stewardship way to preserve life over generations. And that requires deep systems thinking. But I think westernized 21st century societies are not very good at it. So we create these powerful technologies and then we don't think about the possible negative consequences of implementing them very rapidly. And therefore, yeah, I think we just keep putting these quick single solution fixes in place and they often have negative effects that ripple very, very quickly. And this is happening all the time. And I often use the example of the um, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico after um, the, the tragedy in New Orleans. You know, BP spilled all this oil. It went all over the surface of the ocean in the Gulf. And what did they really want to do? Not fix it. They wanted to make it go away. They wanted to get it out of sight as quickly as possible. So they put chemical dispersant on the top of the oil, which made it quickly sink to the bottom of the ocean. That was the quick, powerful solution whose consequences they did not think through. And of course, pretty soon after they did that, they realized it was going to completely obliterate the ecosystem at the bottom of the Gulf. And of course, the chemical was going to seep into the groundwater and create adverse health consequences in the entire region that will manifest for generations, as well as eliminate key, keystone species in that regional ecology. So when you think about things like this going on all the time and in our interconnections, it's not surprising that we are feeling systemic effects all around us all the time. Um, like I say, the, the trick uh, is reading the dynamics and educating ourselves on developing systemic solutions. And, and I think very counterintuitively, um, moving a little more slowly 
before we implement these powerful, powerful solutions. I hope that answered some of the Thank questions. you. Thank you very much. Are there any other? OK. Kate. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, my name's Kate, uh, and I have a what might seem like a little bit of a flippant question for you. Um, a colleague of mine had just recently come across your work, and she, she came up to me. She doesn't speak English very well, and she said, Terry said that she approaches the future with a spirit of optimistic grumpiness. What does she mean by that? And I was thinking just with the, your response here to this last question, like, how do you see the future progressing? Um, we talk a lot yeah. in transition design about uh, imagination and uh, imagining futures, but like, how do you see that from your own personal perspective? Yeah, great question. I, I first have to give proper attribution to that phrase, optimistic grumpiness. That was actually coined by our friend and colleague, Cameron Tonkinwise, <coughs> who's now at the University of Technology in Sydney, but was with Gideon and I for many years when we first launched transition design. And Cameron used to say that we cannot be satisfied with the status quo. The problems are too big, they're too urgent. We have to be optimistic about the future, but we have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and get down to work and get get in the trenches, you know, get, get our hands dirty and start to work now. So I think that part is obvious. Um, yeah, I think the bigger question for those of us that are, <laughs> I spend almost all my time mapping wicked problems and it can get very daunting. You know, I think that you have to be optimistic about the future, however, and I find it's not too difficult to be optimistic if you teach. If you're around young generations of people all the time, you have to remain optimistic for them. I mean, I never had children, but I've been, I've been teaching yours my entire career. And I think for anyone in the audience that does have children, particularly those that are at university and on the brink of adulthood and their entire life is ahead of them. We have to be optimistic in the face of all of the problems that we face. And I think there's a principle from chaos and complexity theory. I did a degree in something called holistic science at Schumacher College. Some of you might've heard of it. It's a center for ecological studies in in the south of England, which is where I met Gideon. Um, and in studying chaos and complexity theory, there's a, there's a uh, metaphor that scientists use to explain it. And they often say a butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon can start a hurricane in Southeast Asia. And it talks about the sensitivity to initial conditions that large open systems have and social systems are open systems. They're changing, they can be perturbed from the outside, but their response is self-generated and changes in one part of the system can have exponential effects as they ripple across the system. So my great hope is really that if enough people start working in on positive change in little ways all over the planet, it can start what is known as a phase transition. And a phase transition is when there's enough small changes that are often in, invisible within a system that they finally accrue and the system flips into something else. It flips into a completely different state. And another metaphor that we use is water boiling or um, freezing, that system completely changes its state. And they've often used in social systems, say the example of the Berlin Wall falling. I'm sure some of you in the audience remember that. I had a company based in Berlin for many, many years. And many people found that just shocking. 
you know, oh my God, the Berlin Wall has come down. It, it burst on the news and we couldn't believe it. But for those people that had been watching political changes, they were not a surprise. They attributed it to many, many small, almost imperceptible moves that were being covered in the news. And then boom, an entire political system just flipped, oh my God. So I think one of the things we can do is start trying to study these social phase transitions to try and understand how many small moves needed to happen before a system flipped. And once you start thinking about it, you can find many examples. So for those of us working for positive change, this is where that connecting up of different solutions comes in. You know, how many people in your city are duplicating efforts or making redundant projects that if connected would have more traction or have more potential to create that phase transition we're looking for. And we think that the level of the city is really an ideal level at which to be working, particularly if you're in an area that is geographically bounded because you can actually see the change starting to happen. Um, yeah, that, those are kind of the things that I focus on in the face of, in the face of what we face right now. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think there's a space for one last question for Terry. Okay, Teresa. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me? Cool. Um, yes, I can. Cool. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I think it was really interesting and I like the uh, practical examples that you gave regarding COVID-19. And I was wondering if you have any tips regarding how to get the stakeholders to buy in, because I have plenty of experience with these mapping ex exercises, ideating exercises, but it's always more difficult when it comes to implementing the solutions, especially in government contexts, let's say. So oh, I would like to ask what is your experience with this and uh, if you have any tips you can give us. Yeah, well, it's a very good question. Um, and tips are always useful, we all want them. Um, but even the word tip uh, sounds like there's some quick thing we could do differently. Oh, if I could just do this one little thing differently, then they'd get it. And I think that there are no quick ways uh, when we're working with stakeholders. I think the problem is we want change to happen very, very quickly. The funders want change to happen very, very quickly. Uh, the stakeholder groups want it to happen very quickly. And I don't think that change is going to happen quickly when it comes to wicked problems. As I said, they took a very long time to become wicked and they will take a long time to resolve. And another useful metaphor is maybe our own health. So if somebody who is obese, diabetic and therefore probably depressed and has a whole host of other issues related to perhaps a sedentary lifestyle or improper diet goes to the doctor. We all of us know that there is no quick fix to that, right? It's going to involve behavior change, a shift of mindset, um, new practices, a change in the entire system of the patterns of living and, and certainly patterns of eating over time to see results. Now, certain things that that, that person might try will possibly yield positive change quickly. And that's what they have to focus on, right? To, continue being motivated before they can see the longer term results the, and the longer term positive change. So I think we have to think about working with stakeholders and solutioning that way. So one of the reasons that we do, uh, we map their, their fears and concerns associated with the problem and their hopes and their fears. We call it mapping stakeholder relations. So one thing that we, we have found, and again, we don't have any experience solving a wicked problem using transition design because it will take decades, right? 
But one of the things that we have seen is that when you get stakeholder groups engaged in a process of saying what their worst fears are concerned with that problem, and everybody does that in their own group, and then you step back and they can actually see the different perspectives and the different ways in which people are actually hurt or harmed or deeply upset about this problem, we have watched people begin to shift a little bit because what you're trying to do is develop empathy. You're trying to get a group that never saw the problem from that other perspective to all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh. Now, that's not going to solve their issues, their fears, but what it can do is if you're a gardener, I'm going to use another metaphor, you know how when dirt has been walked on for a very long time, you have to go up there and you have to till it up. You have to loosen it up if you're going to plant seeds. So those exercises can begin to till the soil and create a bit more empathy. But the other thing we do then is we have them talk about their hopes and desires relative to the problem. And that is where you can begin to do what we call affinity mapping. So you begin to map and look for common ground. So where are the common concerns and fears and where are some common hopes? And that step combined with trying to look for affinity in the common visions is where you can find that low hanging fruit. So the first thing to do, we think, is not to ever think all of these stakeholders are going to agree. They won't. Like, I don't even agree with Gideon half the time on what we need to do tomorrow. But what you can do is you can begin to look for common ground for projects that have broad support. And you look for the quick wins. So what can we do now if it's triage? What's a project we can do now that will do no harm and that will have broad support. And that builds the trust. But you also have to start thinking about the mid and the long term. When I was hired at Carnegie Mellon to be the head of the School of Design, which was a job I had for 10 years, I had to come into a system where there were groups of people that did not agree with the direction the school should go in at all, at all. And so I began to plan a midterm solution of visioning. But the thing that looked to me like it was really broken is we had crappy space. It was really bad. And so I went to work on trying to get people more offices, improving the space. It was a quick win. It did no harm. And it had very broad stakeholder support. Nobody was going to say, no, I don't want a better office, right? So part of what you're doing is trying to read the systems dynamics in the whole system, but also among groups to try and understand where those quick wins with no harm would be and talk to them explicitly about that. You know, you guys can't agree on the big stuff. Where's the little stuff we can agree on? People start working together. They see some positive change and then you can begin to talk more about compromise and the longer end the longer term issues. I mean, that's sort of the, the approach in a nutshell that we take because you are never going to get stakeholder consensus. Uh, you have to look for the tiny quick wins and then talk a lot about compromise, which I can tell you in this country with the political polarization that we have right now is very, very difficult. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And thank you actually for the, that you joined us today uh, for the conference. And yeah, thank you. Thank you again. And good morning, actually, uh, to, the, to Pittsburgh. And I think My we pleasure. will move on. <laughs> okay, goodbye, Terry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Be safe out there.